speak to me today. Yes, God, speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Is that a guy breathing at the end of that video? Did you hear that? <sighs> Didn't quite catch that. I know we're still doing offering. It's fine. It's all good. It's how we roll here. Uh, go ahead and open your Bible to Psalm. Uh, we're going to be in Psalm 28. And uh, we are starting a brand new series today that's going to take us all the way through the summer. Uh, and uh, we have got uh, some awesome stuff in store for you uh, through the book of Psalm. Today is really what they call a Psalm of Ascent and so this would be sung literally uh, on the way as these people, the Hebrew people, would make their pilgrimage to Jerusalem uh, to worship, go to uh, celebrate a feast. Uh, they would go to the temple. Oftentimes this would be sung as they're climbing the steps into the temple. And this is a reflection uh, of their heart. And man, this is, uh, I would title this a fatherly psalm, if you will, in, in Psalm 28. And you're going to be in for a treat. We've got some stuff uh, some great speakers also that are going to be coming, uh, different voices, different styles of preaching uh, over the next several weeks together. And so it's going to be super, super fun. And I can't wait for you to be a part of this. So uh, George, George Packer grew up in Palo Alto, California. And uh, he kind of grew, uh, grew up in the 60s, 70s. And in the late 70s, he graduated from high school with this dream of being a journalist. And he actually did become a very, very successful journalist covering the war in Iraq in its prime. And uh, once he was done covering the war in Iraq, the New Yorker charged him to write an article in the early 2000s, and he was to go back to Palo Alto, to the Simi Valley, to the tech boom industry capital of the world, and to write an article about the boom in the Silicon Valley. And so he heads back, and the uh, Silicon Valley that he left in the late 70s to what he found in the early 2000s uh, was a completely different setup. And uh, he said that he observed this unbelievable trend. And this trend uh, was that everybody in the Silicon Valley wanted to change the world. Everybody wanted to change the world. And so the, actually the title of his article in the New Yorker was Changing the World. And I started thinking about that. And doesn't ultimately, doesn't everybody kind of want to have their responsibility in that moment to have an opportunity to make a dent and an impact in the world? Don't we all want some, in some way, shape, and form to leave a legacy in from our life and the trail behind us is, man, that guy was, we don't want said about us, man, that guy was a joke, that lady was crazy. We don't want that said about our lives. I just have to believe that many of us want to make a lasting impact and absolutely change the world. Is that just me or is that just me? Cool, we're going to start over. And so George Pack, now I'm just, here's the deal. We all, I think, want to make a difference in some way, shape, or form in our lives. What's interesting about Westerners, which is all of us, uh, what's interesting about Westerners is that uh, we have a fascination uh, with change. Matter of fact, one of our presidents got, uh, got uh, voted into office off of a campaign slogan of one word called change. Everybody's like, yeah, I want to rally around this concept of change. Uh, our generation today is absolutely fanatical about all kinds of reform, all kinds of change. It's just part of living in the West. What's interesting to me about that is that most of the change we're talking about is, in fact, large, institutional, worldwide, environmental change. But did you know that that will never happen if you don't change? Real impact and real change doesn't happen on a global scale first. Real change and real impact starts with you being impacted by the power of the gospel message, by you actually letting it change your life here and now. How's that happen? What you're going to see in Psalm 128 is this powerful, like, account 
of impact, of a life lived for the impact in the domains and spheres that we live. So why don't you stand with me as we honor God, as we read his word, because we want to learn today how to make the most impact uh, with our lives. We're going to see this in Psalm 28, uh, 128, and here's the word of the Lord. It says, blessed. Everybody say blessed. blessed. That's pretty good, Darren. You got him primed pretty well. Thank you. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord and who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands, and you shall be blessed, and it shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. And may you see your children's children peace be upon Israel. This is God's word for God's people. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and grab your seat. Here's kind of the big idea if you like to write these things down. The blessed life is the life that changes the world. The blessed life is the life that changes the world. Now, as soon as I say this, there's a, a few questions that start to pop up in our minds. At least it should. If the blessed life is the life that actually changes the world, then let's qualify what is the blessed life then anyway. Well, I think for many of us, the blessed life... Uh, starts off with thinking about being happy. That's what that word blessed means in verse 1. It means happiness. Uh, the challenge with that word is a lot of us bring this idea when it comes to happiness is it's based off of subjective circumstances and experiences. So like I'm happy if everybody in my home is super healthy and nobody's sick. Like that's awesome. I'm really happy if uh, you know my kids actually listen to me. That's happy to me. My kids listen the first time. We tell people at our house, hey, uh, delayed obedience is still disobedience. So first time is what we're looking for. Amen? Parents, amen? Come on, it's a good spot to nudge your kid if they're in the room right now. Uh, but so here, here's the thing. Um, and then we're thinking about, so we're thinking about our happiness, everybody listening, everybody's okay. We're thinking about our health, everything's fine. And then we're like, hey, if, listen. If the bank account is doing well, my business is being successful, I'm on track for these promotions, uh, then I'm pretty happy. The problem with those things, well, let me say this first. None of that is evil. None of that is bad. None of that is sinful. The reality is, though, if your life being blessed is contingent on things like that, then your happiness is going to be like going through the shower drain in your shower. It's just going to go right through. You, if you put sand in this hand, it's just going to fall because those things have cracks in them. Those things are crummy things to build your entire life upon. And so, what in the world then is the blessed life. If that's the life that's going to change everything and going to leave a lasting legacy and impact in the world, then how in the world, or what in the world, is this blessed life? Notice with me in verse 1 what it says. The blessed life begins, number one, with fearing the Lord. I bet you didn't know it was that. Fearing the Lord. That's where the blessed life starts. Verse 1 says, blessed is everyone. Everybody say everyone. Everyone who fears the Lord. Everyone who fears the Lord. Now, when we say fearing the Lord, like we're afraid of God, is that what it's saying? Like we're afraid of God? And it's not being afraid uh, like you're afraid at the mall at Christmas, right? Like everybody afraid of Kenwood Mall at Christmas? Totally afraid of the mall, right? I, I mean, how many of you got accosted this last Christmas at the mall? I was one of them. I did. Mass police nailed me hardcore at the mall. That was supposed to be funny, and you didn't think that was funny. <laughs> now I know where we stand. I'm kidding. Uh, but uh, maybe you're afraid of the sale of the Nordstrom Rack and Marshalls because your wife said she's going to be gone all day long. I'd be afraid of that. Uh, or maybe you're afraid to look at your investment account, uh, and you don't want to look at that today. I'm, it's not that kind of fear that really he's talking about. It's more like the fear uh, that you would feel when you stand at the open door of a perfectly good airplane, thousands of feet above the earth, and your tandem skydiving partner says, are you afraid to jump? And you're like, yeah, I'm totally afraid to jump. And this is what your face looks like. Ah! You don't want to do... There are so many fun pictures, by the way. Of, yeah, I just type in freaking out skydiving. And this one dude passed out as he was jumping out. And the guy's like moving his head around like a little... Uh, it's hilarious. Uh, maybe it's like that. 
Uh, or um, maybe it's the feeling of stepping too close to the ledge of a steep cliff. Take a look at this. <laughs> I love this picture. This is awesome. She's just hugging that glass, uh, the, that, that cliff there. Or, or maybe it's uh, the feeling you get standing on the banks of a mighty rushing river. And you're like, nobody says it and looks at that and goes, I think I'm going to jump in for a swim. Why, why do, why, maybe it's more fear like this. Why would it be fear like this? Well, because what this does is when you stand at the edge of a cliff, when you stand at the bank of a rushing river, when you stand at the edge of an airplane thousands of feet above the surface of the earth, what it definitely does in that moment instantaneously is it right-sizes you. It right-sizes you, and it produces a level of respect, and it produces a level of reverence, and at some level, awe. Because you're not just going to cavalierly jump out of that airplane unless you're attached to a guy with a parachute, amen? You're not just going to run and take a dip in this mighty rushing river. You're not going to do that. Why? Because you realize this thing is way bigger than me. That is the feeling that the psalmist wants you and me to get. When he says the blessed life begins with fearing the Lord, blessed is the one who fears the Lord, it's not the one who is afraid of God, it's the one who reveres God, it's the one who worships God, it's the one who in their soul feels a sense of awe and wonder and worship and respect. It's, listen, gentlemen, you're the guy. This is who I'm talking mainly to gentlemen today. This is a fatherly psalm. This is the truth. Is your life, if you want your life, if you want your family, if you want to be blessed and walk in the favor of God today, you have to start with nothing else but fearing the Lord. That's where it starts. And you start with honor, respect, and worthiness in your heart directed toward God. It's why the psalmist said this in or Proverbs, Proverbs 1, 7, the Amplified Bible, means it amplifies the text a little bit. It kind of gives you a little bit more of the meaning. It says, the reverent fear of the Lord. What's the reverent fear of the Lord? That is worshiping Him and regarding Him as truly awesome. That's what it means to have fear of the Lord in your heart, is to regard God as first place, as supreme, as the mighty rushy ri rivers, as the respect that you would feel at the edge of the Grand Canyon. That feeling that you get of like, oh man, this is way bigger than me, and if I take one more step, I'm going to die. That's the feeling that you want to have when you encounter the living God in your heart, is you want to fear the Lord and treat Him as truly awesome. Why? Because He's worthy of it. And he says that position right there is the beginning, the preeminent part of knowledge. It's the starting point and it's the essence. You want to know where real wisdom, real understanding, real um, growth happens. It's in the heart of a man or a woman or a person who says, God, you're number one. And I'm going to fear you above all things. I'm not going to fear man. I'm not going to fear what happens to me. I'm going to fear what happens to me if I don't submit to you. And that's the beginning place of wisdom and knowledge. And then he goes on to say, but arrogant fools despise skillful and godly wisdom and instruction and self-discipline. You want to be regarded as a fool? Lots of fools today in our culture and society today. It's foolishness to think that you can do whatever you want to do whenever you want to do it, however you want to do it. And the Lord says, hey, to the man who wants to live a blessed life, it starts, number one, with fear of the Lord. Fearing Him, respecting Him, honoring Him, making Him worthy with our lives. This blessed life is marked by reverence and respect, worship and wonder. And this is where true wisdom is found and lasting change begins. But then he says in the second part of verse 1, notice what it says. He says, who walks in His ways. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord and who walks in His ways. So what's the blessed life? One, it's fearing the Lord. Two, walking in His ways. It's walking in His ways. In his ways, I like what Henry Blackaby said. He said, if you know that God loves you, you should never question a directive from him. It will always be right and best. When he gives you a directive, you are not just to observe it, discuss it, or debate it. You are to obey it. You are to obey it. So what the scripture is saying here in Psalms is he's saying, hey, the guy who's favored, the person who's blessed, it starts with fearing God, and then it moves from a place where he walks with him. That idea of walking with him is like walking alongside of him. I'm on this journey with God together. And whatever God says, I'm going to do it. God does love me. The psalmist even says it. Uh, we've already sung about it, but the psalmist says it in Psalm 36. How precious is your unfailing love towards me. Like, God, you love 
me. And that's good. That's an awesome place to be. But here's what's, uh, here's what's incredible, friends. Walking in his ways is this. Very simply put, obeying his word. That's all it is. So it's like if God says it, I don't, I don't, I don't try to talk God out of the message. I don't try to, try to say, hey, God, I know it says this. I know it tells me this is how I'm supposed to treat people. I know it says this is how I'm supposed to uh, love my wife. I know this is how I'm supposed to parent. I know this is what it says about how what I'm supposed to think about you. This is what I'm supposed to think about my money. This is what I'm supposed to think about. Whatever it is, the Bible tells us everything we need to know about life and godliness, the Scripture says. And so it tells us how to live, not us telling it how to live, right? We don't, we don't get to live our lives free from this book. And as believers who want to live a blessed life, here's the truth. You have to align your life with this. You have to align your life with the Word of God. And let it correct you. So what happens then? It's the prayer in Psalm 86. Teach me, God. That's what we have to pray today. Is God, teach me your ways. Teach me. Now what does it say? What does the text say? It says it. It's on the screen for you. Teach me, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Walk, it means to obey. That's what walking in the scripture means. It means to obey in your truth. Now, that's fascinating in our day and age. Nobody, like the modern person, doesn't love this verse. It says, teach me to walk in your truth. Not my truth, not your truth, not somebody else's truth in Sacramento, not somebody else's truth in Manhattan, not somebody else's truth in Buenos Aires, not somebody else's truth in Scotland or New Zealand. Like, no, it's God's truth. And God's truth is the objective truth of reality. And this is what shapes our life, nothing else. When you let everybody else, when you let politics, when you let local politics, national politics, you let your feelings, you let somebody else's feelings dictate how you're supposed to live truthfully in a society, guess what happens? Well, if you want to actually live and be successful, you don't ever walk outside of your house. Because the first time you step outside of your house, that, man... This shirt could be offensive to somebody tomorrow. <laughs> Blue shoes are satanic tomorrow. And so you, you can't, like, that's, that's the problem with living in a culture that defines truth based off of your subjective experience. And Christians, we don't get to do that. That offends a lot of people, but that's okay. We don't care. Because we build our lives based off of the authority of Scripture, because that's the life that's actually blessed. You find me somebody today that's living their truth, and find me a Christian who actually fears God above all things, and walks in obedience to His Word, and I'll show you the real blessed life, and the real life that's free, and the real life that's walking in abundance, the real life that's walking in the favor of God. Living your truth is the quickest way to destruction, friend. So then he says, unite my heart. To fear your name. What a prayer. Teach me your ways. That idea, teach me your ways, by the way, is this idea of literally laying the foundation. So it's, Holy Spirit, lay the firm foundation before me as I'm walking in my life in obedience to your word. Tell me what you want me to do, when you want me to do it, because I can't do it without you. Lay the foundation before me, and then I'll take that step. And then he says, unite my heart. Do you know what that word means? It means undivided. It means exclusive focus concentration. So what he's saying is, God, create in me an undivided heart, an unbelievable loyalty to your word and to your ways. And then as I'm stepping out with firm footing on the truth of your word, you're going to unite me with you. And I am literally going to, I'm telling you what, I'm going to be so confident. I'm going to be so confident in my life. I'm not going to shift with every wind of doctrine, Paul says. I'm not going to be blown away and immature. I'm not going to be a person that's still nursing at 50 years old. I'm going to be a person, like Paul says, that has moved on from milk to meat. And I'm going to be found faithful to the Lord because I started with fearing Him and then walking in His ways. It means I'm obedient to Him. And the truth is, is dads, you can't do that by yourself. You have to have the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to even do this. So the blessed life is a life that changes the world. But dad, it changes you first. Mom, it changes you too. It changes the individual first. If we want to change the world to make an actual dent in our community with the gospel of Jesus Christ, it doesn't happen by big global events, by gigantic prayer meetings. It happens by individual Christians fearing God and being obedient to his word. That's why the church has gotten all wonky. We think it's big crusades at giant arenas. And that has a place. But really, 
It's easy to be fired up for Christ when you've got 10,000 other believers in the room with you. It's harder when you're staring your own sinful face right in the mirror every day. And it says, do I fear God more than I fear everybody else? And then do I walk in obedience to his word? Can't get any more simple than that. You want to change the world, you start by changing you. Fear God and be obedient to his word. Amen? Now, here's the truth. Did you know that that blessed life like that has ripple effects? Did you know a life that lives in the fear of God and obedience to his word? Did you know that that life literally has a ripple effect through so many spheres in society? It's called the benefits of the blessed life. There are actually benefits to it. There are three I want to point out to you today. The text shows it. These three benefits of the blessed life. The first one is uh, faithful work. Faithful work. Look at verse 2. I can't believe we're already here. Verse (laughs) 2. Here we go. Verse 2 says, You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed, and it shall be well with you. He says it shall be well with you. I want you to circle that. Everybody say well. It shall be well with you. It's an interesting word, and it means valuable. So he says, you're going to do something with your hands. You're going to produce some work. This is specifically in the masculine sense. So this is for men. This part right here, ladies, it's for you too, but I'm talking to the men right now, so just hang tight. So here it is. Your part comes up next. So here it is. Uh, You, men, you have to actually go out and grind it out. Like that's the idea, is that you're going to go work. I mean, you're not going to get stimulus checks and think that you're killing it. That's not the way that works. Like you actually have to go work. You've got to go do something. Why? Because like you were hardwired to work. Did you know a lot of people think that the, the curse in the garden uh, was after they, Adam and Eve sinned, that the curse was work and that it was pain and childbearing? Did you know that that's not the curse? The curse was that men, you are going to want to dominate and women, you're going to want to control. That's the curse. That's the curse. So work is not cursed. So some of you men need to go get sweaty and go work. And find something to do. Idle hands create sinful behaviors. So you need to get out. You need to go do something. And then guess what's going to happen? You're going to produce work. When you actually, I'm sorry, when you go work, you're going to produce fruit. You're going to produce labor. When you show up and you're faithful to work and you're out there and you're grinding it out and you're doing your job, you're then going to receive a what? A paycheck. That's part of it, but there are other things as well. But you're going to receive fruit from that work and here's what's interesting he says this that you shall eat the fruit it's the idea uh, of enjoying the hard work that you have done and then it produces fruit and then you are satisfied with that fruit you're full it's like the picture of eating oh man I can't eat anymore you're satisfied with what you have produced with your life you reminded me of this time when Joy and I wanted to expand our flower beds at our house and uh, so we kind of had this idea drawn up, and we had this landscaper guy that, you know, we totally hijacked his plans. He said, you need to go get these plants and do these with these super technical names. So I had to Google them all and figure out where I could go buy all these really technical scientific names for these plants. So we wound up doing that, did all that stuff, bought the anchor plants, bought the color, bought all the stuff that's going to come back every year, brought these shrubs, and then we lined out the, you know, how we want the whole thing to look with our water hose, and then we had all this whole thing set up, and then, the, but the key element, though, was was the sod cutter. And have anybody ever operated a sod cutter before? Okay, so one person, a couple of people. here. Okay, so, okay, three. There you go. I knew you guys. Yeah, I know you would. The Collins know what this is about. So here we go. So I had this sod cutter, and it's got this, like, it's a heavy piece of machinery. And this, uh, like, blade's probably this wide, blade's like this thick, but it's at an angle, and it just yanks, like, back and forth really, really fast, okay? So I buy this sod cutter, and I'm like, okay, we need to take like three or four strips out to get this really cool bulge out and kind of loopy whole thing in, whatever you want to call it, super technical words. Uh, And so anyway, we start it, and I was like, oh, dude, this is really cool. So then I get to the point where it's time to start cutting. And so I'm moving around like this, and I get ready, and I engage the blade. Oh, dude, I did not know what was about to come for me. And I'm like, (laughs) like the whole time I was owned. Do you remember that? Oh, my gosh. I was, my mic came off. I was, see, that's what it was like. I was owned all day with this thing. I mean, I, I felt, I'm still feeling it. I mean, I, this is brutal. It was brutal. And so we finally get all that sod cut. It had to take multiple passes. I thought it was just going to work like, a, you know, warm butter and a butter knife. You know, that is not what it was like. 
So then I remove all that sod, and then we start planting. And I'm telling you, we were planting well into the night. I mean, our sweat was dripping onto the sod, onto the soil. I mean, and this was a lot. And I kept looking over at Joy and going, are you sure you really wanted to do this? Are you sure you want to do this? She's like, oh, yeah. So she was for real. I mean, she was highly committed. So then we finally get done. Notice it said she was highly committed. <laughs> Gentlemen, that's another Father's Day sermon. You just do what she tells you to do, and it's a win. Uh, amen. Stop. <laughs> So anyway, we, uh, we, we, well into the night, we're planting. Then, the joy, though, was the next day. We walk out the front door, we go to the sidewalk, and, I mean, it was just picturesque. We see all of it, and it was the fruit of our labor. We got to enjoy the hard work, knowing what it took to produce it, and then to step back and to look at it and go, oh, man. That's awesome. And it felt, a, I felt a sense of satisfaction because of the faithful, hard work that we put in. That's what this picture, the psalmist, is saying to us. The psalmist is saying that when you put in that faithful work like that, you are literally going to add value and satisfaction wherever you go. Did you know that? Like when you're faithful in your job, you literally add value to you. You look at what you did and you're like, I can't believe I led that meeting. I can't believe that we accomplished those goals. Are you kidding me right now? Way to go self. This was awesome. And then it doesn't just create value to you, but it creates value to your employer. And then it creates value ultimately to your heavenly father. Because you are a living testimony of his goodness in your life. The apostle Paul wrote this in Colossians chapter 3. It says, whatever you do. Whatever you do, what does whatever you do mean? It literally means whatever you do. You don't need to know Greek to know that. That's what it says. Whatever you do, work heartily. Hard work. Grind it out. Why? As for the Lord. You're doing what you do, not for you, not for your employer, not for your, even your family. You're doing what you do, gentlemen, ladies. You're doing it as you're doing it for God. That's your motivation. Your motivation for your, uh, uh, the value that you add to your job, to your society, to your family, any work you try to accomplish, when, even ladies, when you're parenting your kids, gentlemen, when you're parenting your kids, it's as unto the Lord, not unto yourself or even to them. Work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. He's saying don't work for the man, work for the man. You work for him. Knowing that from the Lord, you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. So as you're serving those plates, if you're a waiter, as you're planning those meetings, as you're organizing the strategy, as you're um, making the sales call, as you're negotiating the contracts, as you're leading the teams, as you're coaching through conflict, as you're managing the resources, as you're ordering the inventory, as you're working out all the projects that you're doing on your job, as you're doing whatever you do, answering emails, text messages, anything regarding your job, you don't do it for the man, you do it for God. You're doing it as you're doing it for God. And he deserves your faithful, hard work every day. And that creates value. You know what's going to happen? People who aren't Christians that are your bosses are going to go, i got to hire me more of those. i got to get more of those on my team. I don't know why they are the way they are. But they're working for something of greater purpose and value than what I can wrap my mind around. And i got to get more of those on my team. Because they create value for me. Out of selfish motivation, they ask for those. And then what happens is you are a living testimony of the blessed life. The ripple effect is right where you're working. It benefits you, but it benefits everybody else around you. You tracking with me? Okay, so that's the first area that the psalmist lays before us that says, hey, there's a ripple effect, and it's in your faithful work, but also, number two, in your fruitful home. So you're going to experience fruit in your home. Now, I want to be clear before I go any further. This psalm, Psalm 128, works a lot like Proverbs. I don't know if you know this about Bible study, so just kind of hang tight for a second. Uh, in the, when you start studying scriptures, a lot of people take some verses 
that are not necessarily promises, and they make them promises. Let me say it like this. Sometimes the scripture describes something, and sometimes the scripture prescribes something. This is a description of what a life looks like that fears God and that obeys his word. It doesn't necessarily mean that every single time that you go grind it out and work hard, that everybody looks at you and says, ha, fruit, awesome, valuable. Because there are plenty of times in the scripture where people did hard work and it landed them in prison. So it's not like this axiom that if I do this, then this will happen. It describes, by and large, most of the time what happens when a man or a woman is faithful to the Lord, fears him, and obeys his word. You, you, you there? So this first er the second area is a fruitful home. Now notice where the fruit starts, and it starts uh, with your marriage. He says, uh, your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Now, uh, just grammatically, you guys know I like to nerd out like this. Uh, this is a grammatical tool that we use in the English, and it's called a simile. Anybody know what a simile is? What is a simile? Come on, people. I know it's school. Uh, we're done, but what do you got? What's a simile? Boom! Fire! Come on! Way to go! Exactly what a simile is. So good. Where'd you go to school? All right, well, awesome. Praise God for your English teacher. <laughs> People are learning things. Gosh, so great, so great. So, yes, did everybody catch out what a simile was? Awesome. No? Who said no? You need to go back to the ninth grade. No, I'm just kidding. It's a comparison using like or as. Let's just go that way. Very technical definition, by the way. Great job. So, notice what he says, your wife. So, it's gentlemen. He's comparing your wife I know it's not like super cool, but to a tree, <laughs> to a vine. Um, but honestly, in the Bible, it has a lot to do with some pretty cool stuff. It says first that she it, it's, uh, she'll be like a fruitful vine. So that fruitful in the Bible, when it mentions that word fruitful in connection with your wife, it has a double meaning. Number one, uh, it talks about her fertility, obviously, fruit, producing fruit. Uh, but it also talks about her sexual charm. Jot down uh, Song of Solomon 7, 8 and Judges 9, 13. You can take a look at those two meanings of what that looks like. What he's saying here is that your wife is, uh, let me say it this way, hold on. You are creating a culture to the man who fears God and obedient to his word. That creates a culture in your family where multiplication thrives. Enough said. You got a good marriage. You tracking with me on that one? Do we need to go back and start over again? You're flourishing. Your marriage is flourishing. Seen in the evidence of a fruitful home. Now, is it always kids? Not always. Not always. I don't know what God's going to choose to do in your family as he does from another family. Uh, but what he is saying, another application to this, is there is evidence of fruitful multiplication and growth in your home, physically and spiritually. Now, that should make some sense. And so what this goes on to say, he says, your wife will be like the fruit of the vine within your house. Within is such an awesome picture. Nobody would ever thought that one word would mean so much. But within is this picture of their old, like as the nation of Israel would wander in the wilderness, okay, book of Exodus, there was this little spot in the back of these large tents where these women would go and kind of do their things. Whatever it means to run a house, that's what they would do in the back part of the tent. And the picture of the psalmist is this, that this lady is so buried deep in her house, it means she's faithfully and fully committed to their marriage, faithfully and fully committed into her home, and her feet don't wander to anybody else's tent if you catch my drift. She is faithful to the Lord because she is seeing the fruit of the faithfulness of the Lord in your life. She is watching it fleshed out in you. She's seeing you fear the Lord. She's seeing you love the Lord. She's seeing you worship the Lord. She's seeing you say, God, whatever you want is what I want, and I'm going to be obedient. Even if it's awkward, I'm going to be obedient to whatever you've called me to do. And she responds to that spiritual leadership in you, gentlemen. She does. She's deep within her home. She's committed to you, and she's committed to her family. Now, this other picture is incredible with this simile. She says, it says, your wife will be like the fruit vine within 
your house. Now, here's the picture. It's the picture of grapevines. So these grapevines, as the vine grows, your wife is like a vine producing fruit. As the grapevine grows, the fruit gets weighty. (laughs) And the fruit gets cumbersome. And so the fruit brings stress to the vine. So then, the vine dresser in his goodness and kindness provides a trellis. And a trellis is given and attached to these particular grape vines. And the trellis provides support. The trellis brings stability, encouragement, protection, strength to the vine. So that the vine can do what the vine does best. Gentlemen, you're the trellis. God has put you in this covenant marriage with your wife. And your job is to be the stability. Your job is to be the strength. Your job is to be the support. Your job is to be the encourager. Because as the fruit comes in your home, as the multiplication begins to happen, there is stress on the vine. Ladies, can I get a witness? There's stress on the vine. Don't leave me up here by myself. There is stress on the vine. The fruit is weighty. The fruit is needy. The fruit needs you all the time. And gentlemen, stop being a fruit. Be a trellis. Come on. Be a trellis. And God in his grace as the good vine dresser gave you to that woman to be the support, to be the stability, and to be the encouragement. That's why you've got to fear God above all else and be obedient to his word. You then will naturally be a saving, stability, encouragement, and grace in that home. It's not a compliment when your wife says, I'm raising five kids, and you're one of them. Be the trellis. Be the trellis. Amen? Amen. Well, then he goes on and he says, uh, your children will be like olive shoots around your table. True confession, I had no clue what that was. So praise God, you pay me to study all week long to deliver a word to you so that you understand it. Amen. So here's uh, when a wife and a husband fear the Lord and have an undivided uh, in their obedience to him, it creates a culture in the home that promotes growth. Here's the picture. Olive trees get huge, but... As the buds fall off the olive tree, you'll see a picture here in just a second, of a shoot. This is an olive shoot. And an olive shoot falls typically onto, uh, you know, an opening in the tree or falls down to the ground uh, at the base of these trees. And olive shoots are immature olive trees. It takes about 15 years for these shoots to turn into a branch or to a tree in and of themselves. And then... As that tree grows, this is the crazy part, is an olive shoot takes about 15 years to grow into a tree, but it can yield fruit. Take a look at this. This is what it looks like fully grown. This is one of the olive orchards in Jerusalem. Look at how, you see how those off to the side, that you could tell that they were branches. Their, 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 Their trunks get massive and super huge because all these shoots fall all the time around the base of these trees. And then they grow into these massive thick trunk trees that produce fruit for up to 1,500 years. Now here's the picture. Your children are like olive shoots. They're not trees yet, friend. They're immature. And I'm guilty of making my children act like a tree when they're just a shoot. And our job is to nurture them with grace and compassion and realize, wow, until you're saved, you are a hellion. That's what you are. You are destined for hell until God saves you. And we've got to remind ourselves until they come to a knowledge of saving faith in Jesus Christ that that's their destiny. And we have to remember that they're little sinners. And then, when they profess faith and trust in Christ, uh, Judah is our most recent. And like, I've got to remember, that dude is an immature believer. He doesn't really know, uh, come here from Sikkim. Like, he has no idea. He doesn't understand what some, like, oh, is that actually wrong for me to do? Oh, is that actually right for me to do? He's still learning what it means to be faithful and grow in his faith with Jesus Christ. I've got two teenage daughters. Same thing. They're not necessarily eating spiritual baby food anymore, but they're not necessarily eating spiritual filet mignon either. 
And so they're olive shoots and they take grace and they take patience. But if we're faithful in that, what we will see is those trees, it isn't an, I don't think it's ironic that it takes about 15 years. That's the analogy that the psalmist chose to use. About 15 years for them to begin to mature into full grown trees and then they grow and grow and grow. And guess what happens? Eventually, the olive shoot replaces the tree that it fell from. And that is the legacy that you will leave. You're pouring in, pouring in, pouring in, pouring in, pouring in. Some of you moms and dads, dads specifically, I just tell you, some of you, you ain't got nothing to pour into your kid. So you're just kind of working stuff up together and figuring it out. That's why you have to start with fearing the Lord first. Fearing the Lord means I need Him every step of the way, which is a yielding to Him, which means you better literally put yourself in the posture of humility before Him. Open your Bible Get on your knees, pray to him, and ask him to lead you so that you can lead your family. Get poured into so that you can then be poured out on those little olive branches so that there can be a culture of growth in your home. So much of what we're seeing, I think, in our society doesn't need much reforming that everybody thinks we need. Yeah, I think we need dads reforming. That's what I think we need. It's dads that are just boys with beards. And you act like a boy, you whine like a boy, and you want to be treated like a man, but I'm not going to treat you that way, and neither will your wife, and neither will your kids. Fear the Lord. What woman in the house today wouldn't look at her husband and say, I will follow that man to the ends of the earth if he fears God? I will follow him even if it's hard. But if he fears God and he's obedient to him and I see the evidence of that in his life, I'll follow him wherever he goes. Children will say the same thing. They might not understand it. They might not get all of it. But they'll follow you, Dad, to the ends of the earth. Why? Because you can be trusted. Because you trust in the one who's over all things, not yourself. So there's some insane benefits in your home. Your marriage, your wife receives benefit. Your children receive benefit. And a lasting legacy. Notice what he says in verse 4. Behold, look, see, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. There's a story of a dad who takes his kids on this hike. And uh, they get to this pass where they're obviously going downhill. I think I got a picture of it for you. And they're making their way down a steep cliff with their family. Before they make this trek down this hill, he has to stop and go, okay, what's the best route to take for the safety, not just of me, but for the people that are behind me, that are following me? And so he's standing there. And then as he's beginning to make his decision on the next step he's going to make, somebody from the back says, hey, Dad, be careful. Pick the best route because we're all following you said every kid in this room today of their dad. Hey, be careful, dad, what route you take. Be careful the priorities that you make today. Be careful choosing work over us, dad, because we're learning that from you. We're following in your footsteps. We're learning what steps to take in life because we're following you. You don't think that your steps matter today? Some of you don't even have kids in the home today, and you're like, did my steps matter? Every step you take matters. Because every son always watches their dad. Every daughter always watches their dad. Everybody does. And for those of you that have had a good dad go to heaven early, how many times are you thinking back to that? I learned that from my dad. I saw that from my dad. I experienced that because I learned, I learned how to do that well because of my dad. Be careful. The steps that you make. Because the kids are following. They're following us. The ripple effect 
of a fearful, obedient life is a faithful work, a fruitful home, and a flourishing community. The cool part is, is that it doesn't even just end in your home. It doesn't end there. I mean, that would be cool and good enough, right? A little narcissistic, though. <laughs> it's a little narcissistic to think that it's just about our, us four and no more, just our house. But the truth is, is that the life that fears God and is obedient to his word creates lasting ripple effects throughout the entire world. That's why I would say to you with great confidence that the blessed life is the life that changes the world. Notice with me in verse 5. Verse 5 says, the Lord will bless you. Now, i got to stop. So the first bless is where we get, have you heard the name Asher in the Bible? That means happy. That is the first word, blessed, that we've just talked about. It's about happiness. Now, this word, you'll recognize this one too, it's Barak. It means strength, favor. The favor of God has been put in you and on you, and you have this resolve and this strength that affects not just you, but everybody who comes into contact with you. That's the favor, the blessing we're talking about here. And he says, um, the Lord bless you from Zion. That's the holy city. That's like Old Testament language. It's also like Revelation 21 language. You know, a new heavens, new earth type language. But uh, the Lord bless you from Zion. Uh, may you see prosperity in Jerusalem all the days of your life. Uh, and uh, may you see your children's children, peace be upon Israel. So the structure of verse 5 is interesting. They call it syntax. It just means the structure, the language of it. Here's what's powerful about this word. This, this structure tells us that, uh, I'm just going to read it to you so I don't mess it up. Uh, it was originally written in such a way that tells us that there are direct consequences that are to be expected from fearfully walking with the Lord. There is a direct connection with you, me, fearfully walking with the Lord in obedience to his word. There is a direct connection between what we do and the, 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 the consequence in society that culture feels because of the way that we live. Like, don't blame culture for how dark it is. Blame you. Blame me. Blame Christians. For, for, for putting a little, like remember, put, hide it under a bushel, no, I'm going to let it shine. You've literally put the light of Christ in the bushel over it. You put a bucket over it. He's saying, no, 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 don't do that. Just stay fearful before God, obedient to his word, and shine brighter, as bright as you can. So the question then is, is does it work? Notice what this says. It says, because a, one, a man who fearfully walks with the Lord will lead in his marriage, then his family will create this culture of multiplication. Then because of that, his children will be fearfully obedient to the word, and they'll be obedient to what Jesus says. And then because his children are that way, his family creates that kind of environment where then all the people know, man, those, that family over there, man, they love Jesus, and they're going to be obedient to him. And then there's a group of those people that, hey, they love Jesus. They're going to be obedient to his word. Then there's a larger group of people who do that. That's how a neighborhood changes. That's how a community changes. That's how a city changes. That's how a nation changes. And ultimately, that's how the world changes, is when you and I actually take our faith seriously. We literally stand before God as small as we are, put Him big as He is, and we worship Him, we revere Him, we honor Him with our lives because He's worthy of it, and we obey every single thing He tells us to, even the hard stuff. Yes, the good stuff, but even the hard stuff. And then what happens is one family at a time. One family at a time. The ripple effect starts to happen. So it's not just revivals. That plays a part. But the revival starts in your heart and mind first. When you get a group of people that are serious about that, that's how lasting change and impact happens. That's when we start having conversations about what legacy is really like. Some would say today, I already know the doubters. Yeah, I don't believe it. You're telling me one life lived in the fear of God and obedience to his word, that one life can have a ripple effect and change everything? I don't believe it. 
the great preacher Jonathan Edwards. He's a great theologian and preacher and was the leader of the first great awakening. He lived between 1703 and, 158, uh, and I mean 1758. Here's his senior picture. You can tell it's a pretty old guy. And God used him to launch the first great awakening. And you would say is, um, can one life make that big of a difference? Well, A.E. Winship in the 1900s said, I want to see what kind of life Jonathan and Sarah Edwards led, and if they made an impact. Did they make an impact? If they lived in the fear of the Lord and faithfulness to his word and obedience to him, does it work? And so he set out on a research project, and this is what he found. There were 1,400 descendants of Jonathan and Sarah Edwards by the year 1900. And they founded, just get ready, 13 college presidents, 65 professors, 60 lawyers, and a dean of a law school, 30 judges, 66 physicians, and a dean of a medical school, 80 holders of public office, including three U.S. senators, mayors of three large cities, and governors of three states, a vice president of the United States, and a controller in the United States Treasury. They had written over 135 books and edited 18 journals and periodicals. Many entered, entered the ministry. There were over 100 missionaries, and others were on mission boards across the world. Winship, in his article and research, wrote in the 1900s, mind you, Many large banks, banking houses, and insurance companies have been directed by them, and they have been owners or superintendents of large coal mines, of, iron, of large iron plants, and vast oil interests, and silver mines. There is scarcely any great American industry that has not had one of this family among its chief promoters. One life lived in the fear of the Lord and obedience to his word creates a legacy that can last generations. So what you're doing today, dad, matters. What you're doing today, family, matters. It matters. No one step wasted. If you want to leave a legacy and you want to live a life 